In today's episode of the Back in Shape podcast, we're going to be talking all about injections, that's spinal injections for back pain, for sciatica, whether it's a bulging disc or you've got some sort of degenerative complex going on there, you've got chronic lower back pain. Injections are an option that people consider. We're going to kind of take a deep dive into the options that we've got, how they're going to be working, uh, you know, some of the misconceptions around injections as well. And then towards the end of the episode, we're going to go through kind of a five-step strategy, if you will. If you're someone that's awaiting injections, maybe you've had them booked in and you've got them in six, nine weeks time, something like that. Uh, we'll give you kind of a, a flavor of what you should be doing going forward. So hopefully it's gonna be a really helpful one. Now with something as complex as spinal injections, there are other bits that we'll perhaps have missed out on this podcast. And that's why we have the full article that goes alongside this episode. So if you're watching this on one of the other platforms, you can check out the link, which will be to our website where we've got this video or this episode and the full description and article as well, as well as an area to post comments. And if you are on one of the, the, the platforms with comments, then you can post in this video and we will read and reply to all of your comments to help guide you a little bit more because naturally there are some additional nuances beyond what we're going to be talking about today. So with that out of the way, let's start off by getting into what specifically are injections or spinal injections for back pain. And, and it could be any manner of diagnoses. But the important thing that we identify here, because when we've had people in the past, either clinically or members, they have injections. We could talk about maybe epidural injections and they go, no, 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 I'm having a steroid injection. Or we talk about steroid injections and they go, no, 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 I'm having an epidural injection or something to that effect. And fundamentally, epi um, injections, sorry, uh, they thought they've got two kind of characteristics. We have the location. The location is the epidural space. The location is maybe the medial branch or the, la uh, the lateral branch. The location is maybe a nerve block. The location is maybe a facet joint or sacroiliac joint injection. That's the location first and foremost. The epidural is going to be one of the most common and that's the one we think about, uh, for example, if you're having a C-section as a pregnant lady uh, giving birth, it's in the epidural space. These just refer to the locations that the injection is being delivered. Then commonly it is actually a steroid or it's some other form of pain relieving medication, uh, depending on what you've discussed with your surgeon, whether they want to reduce the inflammation, they want to try and block the nerves, etc. You're basically using the injection process to deliver a medication, be it uh, suppressing the nerves or be it reducing the inflammation to a target area in the hope of reducing the symptoms by just reducing the inflammation. But the important thing to note is this is fundamentally, in principle anyway, no different to taking a painkiller. You're just looking at targeted pain relief for an area and doing nothing fundamentally to change the underlying structure, the factors that led to that condition, etc. And as we'll explore a little bit later on, most of the time when you go down this route and you're having the discussion with your surgeon, they should be talking to you about, you know, you're, this, this is a temporary measure to maybe give you some respite for a period of time. And you need to use that time wisely to address the causative factors behind this. Unfortunately, some people do fall into the trap of considering that perhaps their injection process is going to fix it. Yeah, I'll have the injections in order to take the pain away. And that really is a it leads to a disappointed patient because then we see those people over the years and it's a case of, oh, I had an injection, it worked for six weeks and then it came back. I had an injection, it worked for 12 weeks or it didn't even work and then it came back. And, and that really highlights this real failure to fully understand what the injection is actually doing and your responsibility for the pain. Injections can be a fantastic tool to help someone who's really struggling get on with their exercises, get on with their rehabilitation to actually address the, fund the fundamental causes. But it in itself, is not a treatment strategy um, at all, really. So that's important. And then we get into the next part, which is it's not without risk either. So we have, with all procedures that are medical, there is a risk and there is a reward. We look, we look as best we can to mitigate and reduce the risk component and maximize the reward. And we'll get into this a little bit later on, talking about image guiding and non-image guiding injections. But fundamentally, there is the risk. And the biggest one in, in our mind is the risk of infection. And this is, it's important to not, uh, not, not understate this, risk of these sorts of things and, and getting infections is very, very low. The professionals that you're dealing with, the clinical staff, the surgeons themselves are doing a fantastic job of making sure that that is mitigated to the max. But these things still happen, even if we go for a routine blood, blood test a blood draw, a routine pinprick test. There's always that risk of infection whenever we're piercing the skin. So we have to be aware of that. The only difference is if we're doing a blood draw in the arm or a finger prick test, it's a little bit in a, it's in a area of the body that perhaps we're, is a little bit more easily accessible. When we start going into the spine, the consequences of there being an infection, even if it was the same fundamental in infection, are going to be a little bit more profound. So we have to weigh that up. And again, 
if we had the impression that this injection was fixing a problem, then we might be able to tolerate a higher risk profile because the reward is there. But if we've had adequately, or it's adequately explained to us what the injection is or is not doing, we start to realize that maybe it's a little bit more of a, 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 a decision we want to consider comparing this risk versus reward because there is an element of risk and the reward isn't fixing the problem. So that's something that you, perhaps you hadn't thought about that, hopefully you had, but it's something to consider when you're evaluating whether this procedure is right for you. So that's an important one. The next one is how injections are being used. And this is, this is again, something that sometimes, I think it's, it's always communicated by and large to patients but white coat syndrome is a real thing. You get into the clinic, uh, into the clinic, into the doctor's office, and they say some stuff to you, and you're kind of a bit overwhelmed. You don't know if you can ask any questions. You can, by the way, um, always, and they would encourage that, generally speaking. Um, but then you forget some of the stuff that's been told, perhaps. But fundamentally, the injections are kind of doing two things, and, and often simultaneously. Number one, they're looking to have a therapeutic outcome. We're looking to reduce levels of pain, inflammation. The injection to actually do the job it, it, it's designed to do. We, we suspect that if we um, block this medial or lateral nerve, uh, that the pain will now be blocked and you will not have pain. Uh, so that's the one outcome. The second, so we're looking to provide you with a therapeutic benefit, elimination of the pain. The secondary outcome is to diagnostically confirm or deny that that was actually the issue. So if we have the injection in that region, we block the transmission of nerves to the brain from that particular location that we suspect is causing the pain, or that the pain is coming from, and then we still have pain immediately afterwards, that really suggests that perhaps that was the wrong space. And if we were lining up a course of action that might be we'll do an injection to then see if that works, and then with eyes to do a surgery, that could potentially help us avoid something that perhaps was unnecessary. If we got no relief from the injection that was numbing the area, then perhaps there's something else that is contributing to the formation of the pain. So that's, that's the sort of the dual purpose of these injections. Finally, before we move on to sort of moving forwards from here, the accuracy, and I have to talk about this, and it, and it really cannot be um, stressed enough. We are, as clinicians, whether you're an osteopath, a chiropractor, whether you're a physio, whether you're a surgeon of some description or other, a, another consultant that's doing these sorts of procedures, a physical examination is very limited. When you have the, the benefit, and, and we do, of dealing with tens of thousands of patients over the years who come in with a physical presentation and x-ray imaging, and you can compare up your physical exam, how you have they looked versus how they actually are on a structural level. It's very humbling. You realize that uh, palpation, examination, isn't this sort of uh, you know magical skill that you learn that you're so good at and the average lay person isn't. You're actually not that good. Yes, you can get some gross understandings, but realistically, when you evaluate the effectiveness of these things in a more objective manner, we're not that accurate from the surface. And injections are no different. And most of the investigations from a research standpoint that is looking at how accurate clinicians can be, bear in mind you're taking qualified professionals that are doing these procedures regularly with and without image guidance and with image guidance is significantly more accurate than without so if you're having any sort of injection procedure you better be having it with imaging there's not really any justification that i can think of for doing any sort of injection procedure without having the imaging to go alongside it especially when you're coming close to the spine when you're coming close to nerves and when there are risks associated with this sort of procedure to be able to very easily and relatively in effect, uh, relatively inexpensively drastically increase the likelihood of success decrease the likelihood of any things going wrong poking the thing in the wrong place for example it's just a no-brainer. And especially when there is that limited reward, again, this isn't fixing your problem at all. So to take on board unnecessary risk by doing a non-guided non uh, injection, really I find very difficult to, uh, to, to say that that's worthwhile doing when the other option is there as well. So something to consider with regards to image guidance versus not. But I would say that, that it, is, it is significantly greater to use a tool that allows you to see what you're doing. I always say, if you had a leak in the house and you said to the plumber, hey man, I need you to come around and fix the house, but you've got to stand at the front door and tell me what's wrong and also fix it. You're going to have a hard time. You need to get in, you need to see these things sometimes, especially if we're doing delicate work. Think of an electrician, for example. That's, what, that's what's happening here. So hopefully that gives you a better understanding of the injections, what types, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now we're going to talk into or talk about 
back pain more specifically, because we're talking about minute areas, whether we inject the epidural space, whether we inject this branch of nerves that's coming from the facet joints, that branch of nerve coming off the, off the nerve root, whether we inject the nerve root, very, very small locations. And the reality is it's not one tiny thing that is causing the back pain. It's not one, or it might well be, at a specific area that is injured, but it's a multifactorial problem. So many things feed into why our back pain is there in the first place, and more importantly, in those of you that are more chronic, why it comes about. Let's face it, you don't jump to injections. You To, to, to go down the route of having an injection, you've had back pain for a little while. Maybe it's been a bother for a while and it's gradually gotten worse, maybe you've had repeated episodes, etc. But the simple fact remains that it is not a tiny little problem that can just be injected away. You have to take accountability for that. There will be other people with your exact diagnosis that have recovered effectively. Your body is trying to heal every single day, but you're getting in the way of it. Unless we address the full breadth of you as a patient, instead of trying to focus in on this tiny little region of the body and just pretending it doesn't exist by injecting it with a painkiller to, to, to disconnect that area from your brain, we're really going to be missing a trick. And I will stress, if you want to really get your back resolved, and, and people in this position, you're in a dire straits, you're in a lot of pain, it's affecting your daily life, etc. But you must be willing to make some of these changes. It's so very important. And some of the areas that we need to look at, if you're eating junk food on a regular basis, if you're not adequately hydrated, these are easy wins that can cost you nothing, yet they can have a cumulative effect to improve your overall standing. Eating whole, real foods, whatever dietary choices and regimens you want to follow, whether it's a vegan diet, whether it's paleo, whether it's keto, whatever it may be, as long as you're getting the appropriate amount of calories in every day, good fats, and uh, protein particularly, to support the regeneration regeneration and growth, you're going to do well. You shouldn't be doing, and I understand those of you that are trying to lose some weight, but if you're trying to heal, being an incredibly calorific or calorie restricted diet is not going to help you recover and regenerate very effectively. You need to give your body the appropriate resources to heal. And it's healing that is doing the, is, that is doing the good work. It is not just numbing your brain to an area. And, and that's, that's very important. Then we talk about the lifestyle. I use the example regularly of the child that's constantly skidding their back tire and wondering why the tire keeps bursting, wondering why they keep on getting an injury to that tire. And if you're not willing to make changes in your lifestyle, then you're, you're really asking too much of anything, of, 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 of the people that are trying to help you really. And you're not going to get long-term results. It's no good you walk out of the clinic or you have that procedure and then you're straight back, sat at the desk for eight, nine, 10 hours without making any concessions, without making any um, adjustments, moving over to maybe a standing desk, mixing up your work day. So some sitting, some standing. You will most likely, because unfortunately, we as a society nowadays are not fit and healthy as we should be. There's obesity is, is running rampant. We have a significant waiting list on our National Health Service here in the UK. People just are not healthy. They're not fit. And if you're not taking care of your cardiovascular health and you don't have adequate muscle strength, and that's adequate, and we can get a degree of objective measures, and you can look that up online, and we reference this in a little bit more detail in the article. But you need to actually be strong, be able to move correctly. And if you're not willing to address those things, again, you can numb yourself to the area that's that's problematic by taking a risk through an injection but you're not addressing any of the causative factors there you must be willing to make those changes and and that's 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 kind of a non-negotiable so hopefully that gives you a bit of an understanding some other areas to think about with regards to moving forwards to deal with back pain i think the final thing here pertains to exercises because some people do kind of need an injection you need that help to because, because you're in a lot of pain every day, you can't bring yourself to do certain exercises. But take a moment. We've seen through, through clinical practice, tens of thousands of patients, alongside the members that we've had in the group. Again, we're talking about a lot of people here that we've seen over the years, especially I would say with members online, we used to get people to fill in a little form to give us a bit of information about their back pain. And, and we had tons of these. And the, the number of people that are bed bound with their back pain is, is minute. Chances are, if you're watching this, you're not stuck in bed. And if you are, you've probably gone somewhere else and you're, and you're getting help to get you out of bed. That's important. You're not just stuck in bed all the time. You are doing things. The very, very small minority of people are actually bed bound with the pain that they have. So that means you're not bed bound. And that means you're doing things and you're doing things on a daily basis. You're getting out of bed, you're getting dressed, you're getting on the toilet, you're getting off the toilet, you're getting that going downstairs, perhaps you're going out, you're maybe even walking the dog and you're just putting up and, and, and plowing through the back pain. And every now and then it gets a bit too much to deal with. And that's 
that's when you start to consider the injections again. And that is a real problem to suggest that you can't do exercises, but you can do all of those things on a daily basis. It really is a frustration because you're ultimately suffering all the negative effects of chronic back pain. This feeling of, oh, nothing's helping me, nothing's helping me. And the big problem is that you're not helping yourself by addressing these things and taking a step back and going, right, I'm already willing to lie in bed, to get out of bed, to roll out of bed, to get up and down off these various seats that I use on a daily basis. I'm willing to, because I have to, walk the dog, and then that involves bending down to pick up after them, for example. I have to take the kids to school or nursery or whatever the case may be. And yeah, my back pain's getting too much to bear. Why are you not doing your exercises? There is no excuse for not doing the appropriate exercises. Now, we can we, we have whole other podcasts on the right and wrong exercises, and that's why we do the podcast, to give you guys a full and 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 very robust source of free information to help guide you away from the wrong things and towards the right things. But seriously, if you're someone who's considering injections, you're saying, oh, I've got so much such bad back pain, I can't do any exercises. Really evaluate if that is a true statement or if you just won't do exercises because the two are, are, are very different. And if you are already doing some of those activities, you can lie on the bed and practice engaging your core. You can practice a squat if you're getting out of chairs because at the moment you're getting out of those chairs and causing problems. You may as well learn to move correctly now before you perhaps have the injection by doing these movements and learning how to do them correctly. And maybe you're getting a bit of guidance with that to, to teach yourself how to do them correctly. And for example, if we take the squat, you, you, every time you get out of the chair, it hurts your back. Okay, why? Because when you get out of the chair, your legs aren't strong enough, so you're rounding your lower back to push yourself out of the chair. Your back flexes over, that stresses the tissues in your lumbar spine that are injured, the ones that they might do the injection on. And you're, you're compromising all the structures that are trying to heal, plus you're putting compression as you drive up uh, through the spine, and that's aggravating the tissues. Well, if instead you learn how to squat correctly with a neutral spine, not exposing any one particular structure as you go to get out of the chair or sit back down into the chair, you're going to start to plug a gap in your daily life that is constantly aggravating your pain. And sure, the squats might be uncomfortable because you don't know how to do them correctly. But with guidance, you'll start to do a, sh a more shallow squat, one where you do maintain the structure of your spine and it doesn't bother you as much. And you realize, hey, in terms of how deep I can go, I can only bend my legs slightly before, the, before I, I, I lose control of my back and my pain kicks in. Well, that's fine. That's the starting point. And you work towards improving it so that you can sit in a chair with good form without your back moving all over the place and aggravating your pain. But you must get these things sorted because if we take a step back to what we discussed at the start of today's podcast, talking about what the injections are doing and potentially the fact that we didn't discuss at the time, but certain steroid injections in particular will have a short term limiting or, or um, they, they, they limit or decrease the tensile strength of the ligaments and tendons in particular. Now this is well researched within shoulder injuries where we're injecting into the supraspinatus tendon and with Achilles injuries where they're injecting steroids to reduce inflammation in those tendons. There is a temporary period, it's, I think it's days to weeks, where days to a couple of weeks, not a long period of time, but a temporary period where there is decreased strength and integrity of those tissues. If we now think about you end up having the injection and you haven't spent the time beforehand to improve your technical prowess, your technical skills, your technical abilities, the worst case scenario is you actually are in that little window where you've got reduced competence in the soft tissues that have been injected or around those soft tissues that have been injected. So now you're more likely to actually cause trouble. On top of that, and even if you didn't suffer with the actual chemical reaction from a point of view of to the uh, side effect of the steroid injections, you just have a, a lesser awareness of the area. So because the pain's not there, you're not moving in a, in, a, in a limited manner. So therefore, you're not quite as conscientious about your movement. So you'll probably just cause damage to the area anyway, because the area is injured fundamentally. And you're having that injection to numb the pain. Now you're less, less aware of when you aggravate the back. So you can continually cause more trouble. Whereas if you learn to move correctly before you have the injections, improve your competence, improve the supporting structures for your spine, your spine has had good habits or you have had good, good habits of spinal health and hygiene that will at least have started short, a couple of weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks to build up this, these things, perhaps before your injection, isn't gonna make a, a complete change, but it's gonna improve you. And it's better starting now than it is right after the injection when you have reduced feedback and you're not quite sure how you're moving. And therefore you've put yourself at risk from perhaps making the issue worse unbeknownst to you. So hopefully that gives you guys a couple of things to think about especially if you are someone that's considering injections as a means of helping you with your lower back pain.
sometimes it is necessary. And there are also many cases where people have, as, as well as the, the not so good size, where people have the injection, they don't do the work, then it comes back and they're wondering why, why is it not working? Why are these things not working for me? And actually the question should be, why do I not want to work for myself? There are cases where people say, do you know what, I just need to have this injection. Just get rid of it so I can do my work. And then they do the work, they do the rehab, and actually they have really good results as a result. And that would be a successful use of resources that are available from modern medicine to help you make better decisions and ultimately make a better recovery. But we'll finish with five steps that you might take if you were someone that is lined up for having some injections in four, five, six, eight, nine weeks time for the lower back. You're thinking, hey, I just need to have this done. Normally it's scheduled out in advance. It's very rare that you might have it the next day. So what's the first thing we're gonna do? Number one, and this is effective immediately, change your diet, make sure you're eating properly, get the appropriate amount of protein on board on a daily basis, appropriate amount of calories on board, cut out junk food, eat, uh, drink well, drink the appropriate amount of water, get rid of alcohol, other things that are not helping your body heal. Know that if you've got a chronic issue, you want to give your body the best possible chances. And this is free. Why would you not do it? It will have a positive impact regardless of where this takes you. The next step, is to start changing your lifestyle. It's no good if you're continually moving in inappropriate manners, you're deciding you are going to uh, you know, sit at that desk for eight, nine hours straight. You have to understand the injury that's there and move a little bit more. Don't get stuck in one position at a time. You have to adjust the way perhaps you're doing things at home, adjust the way you move. When you instinctively go down to pick something off the floor, you're bending with your knees and hips rather than rounding the lower back. These things will help you and you can immediately implement them. Granted, with the lifestyle changes, that's something that you'll continually work on. You won't get everything in the first week, but you'll st steadily, especially if you've got some support, you'll steadily be able to be like, hey, is this good for my back or could I do this in a smarter way? And then you can make those modifications. But it starts now and both of those first two steps are easy to do straight away. The next step is going to be talking about exercises, doing some exercises that focus on maintaining spinal neutrality. That is supporting the neutral position of the lumbar spine you can start this off, off weight bearing, as I mentioned, lying in the bed. Everyone can do it, bar no one. Then we can move that out and we can do some other floor-based exercises, which can also be done in the bed if you absolutely can't get on the floor. And sometimes that's necessary in the early days to just do them on the bed. You can progress onto the floor later on when it's easier for you to get down there and back up again. And then, well, you probably won't have time for this, but steadily building that out to, to, to add resistance, that will most likely come in after the injections. But by that point, you've started making some progress with the, the right sort of exercises. You've made some lifestyle changes and you're improving the way in which you eat, the way in which you fuel your body, fuel your recovery. Now, all of a sudden, a couple of weeks have gone by, you're at that point where you're considering the injections. Maybe you've got the appointment tomorrow, maybe you've got it in you know, a day or two's time. And you can really stop there and say, hey, look, I've actually done this consistently. I've addressed all of the areas consistently for a couple of weeks. How do I feel? Maybe you actually feel, hey, I don't know if I need this injection anymore. I'm actually starting to make some progress. And I don't know if the reward is worth the, worth the risk at this point, especially considering the trajectory of this progress. Now, you might be very, very lucky and that might be enough to get you to a point where you're actually experiencing pain-free. But chances are, especially if you've had the back pain for a long period of time, it's just gonna be enough to get you starting to get some sort of hope that things can actually really go in the right sort of direction. At that point, you might have a discussion with your surgeon and say, hey, look, would, we, would you mind pushing this appointment back maybe for a couple of weeks, another six weeks, and I'll just see how I'm going, continuing on with my rehab work, and, and then maybe we can reassess then. Most of the time, your surgeon is gonna be like, hey, no problem at all, let's push it back. You're taking a charge, you're taking accountability for your health, that's an awesome thing, and I just wanna encourage you to do that. So they'll happily move that thing back. It may be that actually, do you know what? you do just need that, that injection still. So you have the injection, but you've improved your overall bodily health. You've improved your diet. You've improved the way in which you're doing things on a daily basis. You've learned some skills, some ways of moving. So now post-injection, you're significantly better off. You've done part of the work already. Now you can embrace not having the pain in your back, not having the pain going down your leg and really continue on your rehabilitation following a little bit of guidance, especially in those early weeks afterwards from the surgeon to give you guidance on when you can get back to certain specific exercises. You want to be specific with the exercises that you're doing and when you can return to them. Because if we just leave exercises, this broad open just statement, when can I do exercise? That doesn't really mean anything. It means everything and nothing at the same time. So be specific with what precisely you're doing and what you're having to do on a daily basis, maybe for work, and when you can get back to those sorts of activities based on having the injection 
in the area that you've got. And, and that should be a discussion that should be had with your surgeon. I would recommend writing down these sorts of questions ahead of time and just having them on a piece of paper so you're nice and organized. And you know, the, the, the white coat syndrome we mentioned earlier doesn't kick in and you forget. But then going forwards from that point, use it as a opportunity to really progress your resistance training, to build up the strength and tolerance of your lower back, to help guide the, re the rebuilding process in and around that lumbar spine to restore the strength and integrity to that section. Using this procedure of injections to actually really help your recovery because you viewed what it is giving you as a patient in the appropriate light and you don't have false expectations that it's some random or some miraculous um, intervention that's just going to click your fingers and all the pain has gone away. You understand that it has, may well have eliminated the pain, which is awesome, but now the work is back over to you to be consistent. The very worst thing you can do is check out all the good stuff and get straight back to all the things you were doing before because unfortunately, most of the time, it's when back pain affects us so that we cannot do what we want to do, that we start to look for a solution. Often people will tolerate the back pain for a long period of time until it gets in the way of what we want to do. And when the back pain is gone, the limiting factor and stopping you doing those things goes away. And all of a sudden, all your time goes back into that thing. And what exercises? What exercises? I'm not supposed to do. I don't need to do those. I feel okay again. Please, I would encourage you, if you've had injections, do not make that mistake because you'll join the many people before you that have said, I tried injections and they didn't work for me. It's not that they didn't work for you, it's that you didn't do the work and you need to be honest with yourself about that. So to end on a rather serious note, hopefully you have found this particular episode helpful. I know there's some, some, some important bits, some serious bits, but also I do hope that it's helped you better understand the appropriateness of this particular intervention. It is something that a lot of people have questions about. If you have any, use the comment section underneath here, ask away, we're there to help. Hopefully, again, if you are someone that wants a little bit more information, the detailed article will be a helpful resource for you as well. It's about 3,000 words long. We put a lot of work into it and hopefully it just gives you more narrative around what I've already discussed. Um, again, thank you so much for watching. If you did find this video or episode helpful, give it a thumbs up. If you know someone else that could benefit from it, consider sharing it with them. And if you do find the Back in Shape podcast helpful, remember you can always subscribe to make sure you get notified every week when we release a new episode. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.